Good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar on the sustainable recycling of critical materials and lithium ion batteries. My name is Ayana Lynch, and I am a research assistant with the Chemical Sciences Roundtable at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. The Roundtable provides a neutral forum to advance the understanding of issues of importance to chemical sciences and engineering and promotes the exchange of information among government, industry, and academic sectors. This is the first webinar of 2023 and a series of webinars on emerging topics. We launched our series of webinars in early 2020 and all the presentations can be found on the CSR website. Today, we will provide an overview of the process of battery recycling, discuss the critical material needs to improve the recycling strategy and present innovative research in the industry. The format will consist of three presentations. There will be time for one or two clarifying questions after each presentation, but all their questions will be addressed in our discussion time after the presentations conclude. Dr. Mark Jones and Dr. Ian Rowe will be our moderators for this webinar. In addition to being members of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable, Dr. Jones is an independent consultant at MJPHD LLC with over 30 years of experience at Dow Chemical Company. And Dr. Rowe is a technology manager with the U.S. Department of Energy's Bioenergy Technologies Office within the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. They will be asking the questions on behalf of the audience during the discussion time. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A button on Zoom located in the bottom control panel. Note that the chat feature has been disabled on Zoom for audience members. Finally, I would like to invite everyone to our upcoming events, including a webinar on chemistry and synthetic food and a webinar and workshop series on publications in the future. The workshop will be held both online and in person at the National Academy of Sciences building in Washington, DC. To find out more about our upcoming events, please see the CSR website. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Hans Eric Mellon. Mr. Mellon is the Managing Director at Circular Energy Storage, a London-based consultancy focusing on life cycle management for lithium ion batteries. He founded Circular Energy Storage in 2017, leveraging his experience in the battery recycling industry and from advising companies and governments in circular economy, eco-design, and energy policy. He is a widely quoted expert on battery recycling. With that, I will hand it over to Mr. Mellon. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope everybody hear me well. Um, and I will start to, to share my screen. See. Hope that works. All right. Yeah, thank you everybody for, uh, well, thank you for, for, uh, for inviting me um, and to, uh, to cover this um, yeah, very important top topic. Um, I will talk or give an introduction about um, recycling our lithium-ion batteries. And awkwardly, I might talk a lot about not which is recycling or not, not about recycling per se. Um, and I will explain why. Um, we hear a lot about that recycling of lithium-ion batteries not happening. Um, we hear about that only 5% of lithium-ion batteries being recycled. That is a number that is very often used in the US. Um, but um, we hear other stories as well about like 3% in Australia or that only 1% of lithium is going to recovered. None of those numbers are true. They have never been true. Um, and it's quite easy to really go down and check the references uh, where these are coming from. Um, lithium-ion batteries have basically always been recycled, not uh, always as efficiently um, as it could have been, but they always been recycled. And I will give a little bit of context of where recycling comes in into the, the lithium-ion battery industry um, and why it might be that we haven't recycled that much batteries and why we haven't recycled so much in the US or in Canada or in, in, in Europe, um, but we have recycled much more elsewhere. Um, I guess everybody or most people know about the, the lithium-ion battery. Um, 
which um, which is a very important invention. I mean, it's not the first rechargeable battery. We we have been having everything from from lead acid, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hybrid batteries before, but lithium ion battery with its energy density, but also also in many ways versatility has been a very important innovation for for a lot of um, or enabler of uh, a lot of different kind of devices and uh, um, and equipment. Um, in this picture, you basically see the, the, the most important component, which is really in, interesting and important when we talk about recycling. Um, we Basically, we have three different kinds of batteries, which you see from left to, to right here. We have cylindrical batteries, which can look like basically um, a small AA battery. It's a little bit uh, usually bigger than a AA battery. Um, and we have prismatic, which you actually don't really see in this picture, but they're basically uh, there are like um, square batteries um, um, that can be um, stacked together uh, in a neat way. And then we have what we call pouch cells, which basically are like aluminum bags with, with actual uh, uh, materials inside. Uh, you can also see that we have the, the, the cathode, which is an um, aluminum current collector, which is covered with the, the cathode material and which is usually what we are really interested in in the recycling sector that's why you would where you would find the, the lithium uh, nickel and manganese and cobalt and uh, a little bit depending on what kind of cathode we are talking about and you have the anode uh, which is um, a, a current collector made by copper and where you have graphite uh, covered and it, the battery works like uh, the we have lithium ions that are traveling um to and from the cathode to the anode. Um, and the lithium is first um, part of the cathode, and then it goes back and forth. Um, what we what was really interesting when, when we look at this market is how um, phenomenally it has been growing. Um, if I would take this chart and I would take it only to, to 2010, it, it would in fact almost look like, like this. I mean, the, uh, we just don't see the growth uh, in the early years uh, right now, only because it has been growing so much the last decade. And what you can see is here that what everything started really with uh, portable electronics, uh, like um, the first was a, um, um, a webcam or, uh, or a camcorder. And then we uh, it was really the, the mobile phones and laptops and uh, later tablets and other different kind of uh, electronics that, that were important for, for this uh, market until uh, in the in the beginning of last decade. Uh, that's where when we we, we started to see uh, batteries also made in, made in them into to cars, um, to buses, and to a variety of applications. And and today we 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 now see them in more futuristic. Uh, applications such as aviation, we have them in ferries or in robots, uh, and they they are really an enabler of um, of new innovations. But you can also see in the in this chart that it, it is not that strange that we are talking so much about electric vehicles in the lithium ion battery industry because light and heavy electric vehicles are is really what is driving uh, this industry right now. What's also interesting in, when we look at this is. Um, and when we look at the future, you can see that this will only continue to grow. Um, and again, it's, it's really on the vehicle side where we see this huge growth uh, happening. So, of course, um, this is um, it's certainly a very important topic and uh, recycling uh, becomes, of course, important when we, when we realize how much material we actually will need uh, um, for, for this. Um, I think if you look at the, the, the chart to the left, you, you might also understand that recycling cannot really be a huge contributor, no, at least not in the um, in, right now, because um, most of the batteries that we are using today, they, they are in devices where they will continue to be um, for, for quite some time. Um, and if we look at, um, yeah, yeah. From, First of all, yeah, um, I will, yeah. So yes, to, to finish on, on, on this, um, and I will talk a little bit more, more about this. But when we talk about that, we were going to feed this industry with recycled materials. 
it doesn't really make sense because we, we, we can't really feed the industry with the same devices that we are trying to build. I mean, uh, you, you can't really take my battery from my laptop because I still use it. And in, in that case, you will actually use that material only to make a new battery in, in my new laptop. So it doesn't really make makes a lot of sense. An interesting thing with, with lithium ion batteries is also that, um, I mean, it's um, and then from a recyclable uh, recycling perspective, it's that it's very, they are very valuable. Um, if you look at lead acid battery, they, they basically um, they have a value of around two um, two dollars a kilo. Uh, but as you can see here, the, um, the price for, for for lithium ion batteries is much more than that. Uh, it's also interesting to to see how how volatile the market has been lately, and and also when we talk about certain chemistry, and not least uh, about lithium iron phosphate battery, which is the, the cathode which do not in, uh, contain uh, cobalt or nickel, uh, it's always described like a, a battery that is not worth something uh, or worth very much. And that is also why it's cheap. But you can see here that uh, it's actually worth quite a lot today, and it, it is worth basically what an, an LCO battery, the, the, the battery with most cobalt inside, uh, is worth more than that than uh, what the LCO was uh, two years ago or three years ago. And nobody really complained about the prices of LCO battery by then. So then if we look at um, what is available for recycling, yeah, if you, you remember the last picture, we, we showed that in 2030, we, we might have a market uh, that um, that will put about 3.4 uh, terawatt hour um, of batteries on the market, um, a huge amount, uh, obviously. Uh, and I forgot to tell you, but, but that is uh, based on a forecast that we, we basically will sell about 46 million electric vehicles that year. Um, here, if we look at our forecast on what is will be available for recycling, it's um, it's actually around 175 um, uh, gigawatt hours. So, so it's far from um, what we actually will place on the market by by then. Um, and I will a little bit try to explain why is it so uh, so much less um, batteries uh, available for recycling than what we are placing on the market. Yeah, the first obvious one is that. Um, the batteries last for a very long time. They are obviously rechargeable, uh, and they, they they last much longer than what we uh, what we expect. Like electric vehicles, I mean, the personal uh, cars last uh, for a very long time um, because we even if the battery get, is getting worse and not is always perfect, uh, or even after ten, if fifteen years, people can use them maybe not for the same purposes, but they still can use these vehicles. And also, the battery becomes much bigger which means that 50% of a battery 10 years ago is very different to 50% of a battery um, in today and, uh, and even more in the next year. Yes, basically 50% of a battery that is placed on the market today is more than 100% than from an electric vehicle um, placed 10 years ago. Another very important aspect, super important in fact, when, when we talk about recycling is that Lithium ion batteries are built in into the into the devices. It's essentially only batteries in um, in power tools and um, maybe in cameras that you even touch yourself, because otherwise it's always the professionals that, for some uh, reason, are are, uh, are are repairing or uh, mounting the batteries in the in the devices. That also means that the battery does not they they do really have not their own lives. They uh, they live the lives of the um, uh, of the devices or the equipment. Uh, so, for instance, if this equipment is traded, which it is, we from from the U.S., for instance, uh, we have a huge market for for, uh, for used electronics that usually will be exported to other countries, and the batteries will of course follow. And in fact, um, from North America, from Europe. We are selling a lot of electric vehicles to other markets. Uh, and of course, the batteries are included in those devices as well. So many of these batteries will never make it, uh, make the, make, make it to end of life on the, the, the US or the European market. This is the main reason why we are not recycling a lot of batteries in, um, in, in these countries, um, because we don't have so much batteries to, to recycle. Um, 
this also shows that why we have um, why we keep the the electric vehicle for a long time the, the values are keeping up very well we believe that uh, as we, we showed before that electric vehicles will remain on the roads with the batteries um, for about 20 years and as i said um we have a lot of trading uh, of this this does not really impact the uh, the recycled uh, materials or the amount of recycled materials in uh, in the world because <laughs> obviously they are just going to other market but it does have a big impact on the amount of recycled materials in uh, in the western economies uh, because we are we are usually not the the last uh, users of the equipment we place on our markets Another reason is uh, also that batteries, when they in some ways reach end of life, uh, when they are removed from the original applications, they are reused. Um, and that is obviously just like the, the long lifetime, a great thing. Um, and batteries are reused in so much more than only an energy storage system, which is something that is often referred to uh, as second life but they are reused in the actual vehicles. They can be used for upgrade and range extension. We have a lot of uh, uh, conversion of uh, like classic or um, old cars, but also more professionally in, in fleet conversions. Um, a lot of electric vehicle batteries are used to, uh, to today to power boats or to energy storage system at homes. Um, and we have a lot really going into replacement of lead acid batteries uh, in backup systems or in, in two and three wheelers, uh, which is a big market in India, for instance. And a lot of, of this reason also goes to, to export. So, so that means that these batteries might, even if they once will be recycled, they in many times they won't be recycled in the Western economies. And, and this shows this uh, fairly well that um, the, the reuse values of batteries, they, they are so much higher than the, uh, the material value. So the green line here, you see uh, um, for a Tesla Model, Model S battery, for instance, what, what the materials inside, and that is really before we have done anything to that battery, but the, the material is worth a lot, as you can see on the green line, but it's nothing to the actual price that many are paying for, for, for these batteries because they want to use them, even when they have been for many, many years in, in the vehicle. And you can also see that if, um, if this, um, if we compare to, to what um, a recycler that will shred these batteries and produce what we call black mass, which is a first step in the recycling process, um, that recycler will, will, will get much, much less for that battery after being doing a quite uh, decent job on it uh, than what um, uh, somebody that will reuse the battery is able uh, or prepared to pay. So that is usually diverting the battery from the recycling market. Um, and here you can see in, in, in both in Europe and in the US, um, we don't expect this market to grow like exponentially in any way. We, we definitely believe it will grow, it will grow a lot, um, but, but it's not that it's just exploding in that way. And you can also see that we we see that for, for many years, it's really um, portable batteries or battery from um, from a personal mobility, uh, uh, e-bikes and so, that will actually be a very important feedstock and electric vehicles, it will be really, um, really later uh, that, that we will see that that, they, that will um, uh, come and become more important. I see that the number on Europe here are wrong. It should be like in the US, it's uh, until 2030. So <clears throat> recycling then. Um, if, um, if there will be no batteries for recycling, uh, do we re recycle batteries? Well, there will be a lot of batteries to recycle. There will be a, really a lot. Um, and there have been batteries for recycling. We have been recycling batteries in, in, in the US. We've been recycling batteries in Europe for, for, for many years. Uh, this shows uh, four different or the key uh, challenges when, when we are recycling batteries. Uh, when we are talking about electric vehicle batteries, we, we have the we, the first challenge is to, to disintegrate the battery pack to, to make that, um, I mean, to, to basically lift out the models, uh, modules and the cells and 
make it so we can handle the battery uh, in the recycling process. This is something that often is used or done already when we want to reuse a battery. Um, so, so that is a good thing because that means also that the high value process can pay for, uh, for this process because this is usually quite costly because it will take a couple of hours for one or two persons to, um, to, to, to disintegrate the pack or open up the pack and make it available. Then, then different kinds of processes can deal with this. Today, we, we have a few recyclers that can uh, basically shred the complete pack. We have a, several processes that can deal with the, the whole uh, modules uh, as such as well. Um, but many needs to go down further and be more disintegrate them. And then we go down to the cell level and uh, all different kind of process must open the cell so you can actually uh, start to, to get into the actual material. And that is something we call uh, pre-processing and there are different kinds of technologies to, to, to do that. That is something that um, has a challenge both in, in to do this efficiently and to, to, to really get the material in a good state uh, for it to be processed in the next step. It has also uh, health and safety uh, aspects to it and um, in local environmental uh, challenges as we, 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 we have off gases and um, yeah, different kind of material that's, that, that really need to be addressed. Then we have material separation and that means that we, we now we want the, we, to recover the, the materials and get them back in some states. So, um, Usually, we would like to, to get cobalt and nickel and manganese um, um, in in the salt that they were originally. So uh, usually, um, these material will go back as uh, a sulfate, so in some cases like chloride. Um, but usually, it's uh, cobalt, nickel, sulfate, or lithium carbonate, um, and that is obviously uh, not a very easy process. Um, um it's about both about the uh, purities and um and and really to 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 try to recover as much as possible from each uh, each element um and then a uh, last part is really if we can go go that far to to do material regenera uh, regeneration so we actually create new battery materials out of it that can either be part of the actual recycling process or it can be something that the cathode or um, a precursor manufacturing is dealing with. Um, of some reason, recycling has so is so often described as a technology play, and um, of course, it's it's, it's not anything that, or, or not something that anything anyone can do. Uh, it's uh, it's a lot of IP behind, um, but. It's not true that this is not something that we haven't been able to do for many years. I mean, we we have had, especially in China and, and South Korea, we have had recyclers that have been um, doing battery recycling and put back the materials into capital materials for, for more than 15 years. Um, they have had a, a couple of really important um, advantages, and, and one being that they actually are producing batteries and they are producing battery materials, which means that they need battery materials. They also have had access to much more feedstock uh, due to the, the production waste coming from the battery uh, production, but also because uh, collectors have seen a market in this and of that reason, they have basically got most of the batteries uh, in the world. So that, of that reason, they've been able to, to scale the processes much more than what we have had been able to do in Europe or in, um, or in America. Um, as you can see here, there are several different kinds of routes. There are many more routes uh, than, than this. Basically, it's uh, usually about uh, that the batteries are, are shredded, um, but we have uh, also uh, processes where we are applying mel uh, smelting to it. So, so we basically create an alloy that later can be processed in hydro metallurgically, which is the case for all of these. So either we, we, we mechanically open up the cells or we are uh, melting the cells down, but uh, it's both of the same reason really that create the material that then can be processed further. I have never really understood why we are talking about a hydrometallurgical process versus pyrometallurgical process because it's really either a mechanical process or a pyrometallurgical process that later will go in a hydrometallurgical process. 
And then the same thing here. I mean, we have several different kind of routes uh, for the hydrometallurgical route, um, uh, processes um, that has been in industrial use for, for many years. And then we have new processes that, uh, I mean, doing it differently and in some cases more, more innovative and uh, something we are talking a lot about today, not least uh, in the US, is uh, the case for, for what we call direct recycling, that we, we basically are uh, with different kind of technologies, it can be anything from a dry technology, but also in, in, in wet technologies where we co-precipitate the materials and basically not separate the different kind of salts, but we go back again directly into the, 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 uh, the cap of materials. Um, it's also important to understand that we, we, we have products from recycling then on, on different levels. We have uh, um, Pardon me, Hans Eric. I, I, I hate to interrupt, but we are running very short on time. Can you? Oh, okay, right. You then we are. That's great. Thank you. Then, um, yeah, we also show this one. Uh, the last slide here is um, um, we have today recycling capacity um, uh, that is more than what we expect that will be battery and for for the next next decade. A lot of that is in China, but we are basically coming into the same situation in the West. So thank you. I'm sorry for going over. No, 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 no. Thank you very much. So uh, this is Mark Jones, one of the hosts today. We are getting a poll question ready for the audience. And just a reminder, if you want to ask questions, please type them into the um, question and answer window. So the poll question should be on your screen now. Why don't we go ahead and and make your selections and we'll close that out in you know, five, four, three, two, one. So the question that was asked was where you find information about how to recycle batteries in your community. And uh, the local fire marshal is the only one that really is a bad answer. Uh, call to recycle or call to cycle.org and earth 911. Both are websites devoted completely to battery recycling about um, any type of battery. And Google uh, is a good start, but it does not always give you the most up-to-date information and occasionally can lead you to erroneous places. But most communities, if you type in your zip code, you'll find out where to recycle your batteries. So thank you guys for participating in that. Um, I will now, it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Rebecca Ciaz is Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Environmental and Ecological Engineering at Purdue. Her research focuses on the technology and policy challenges of integrating energy storage for decarbonizing electricity, transportation, and industrial systems. She holds a bachelor's from Columbia in mechanical engineering and a PhD in engineering and public policy from Carnegie Mellon. Her 2019 paper, uh, Nature Sustainability paper on lithium ion battery recycling is one of the most thorough treatments that we found in preparing for this webinar. It should be required reading for anyone interested in battery end of life issues. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Rebecca. The floor is yours. Thanks Mark for that uh, kind introduction. Um, I'm excited to share a bit uh, about some of that uh, work on um, environmental impacts of battery recycling. Um, so as uh, Hans Eric sort of got alluded to and talked about in his presentation, um, there are a lot of energy intensive materials that go into uh, these battery chemistries um, and they end up being a key driver of sort of the cost and embodied emissions when we go to manufacture batteries from, uh, from the get go. Um, so many of these cathode materials include transmission transition metals like nickel and cobalt. And so um, those are very and energy intensive to produce. And they, there's a lot of emissions associated with that. Um, but we have sort of seen some shifts um, in sort of the market trends for the exact sort of flavor of lithium ion battery chemistry that's being deployed as um, the market has responded to some of these challenges. And so this is a plot from Bloomberg New, New Energy Finance. Um, showing how their projections of demand for cobalt specifically have changed over the years. And so the blue line from 2019 shows this really uh, staggering growth in uh, demand for cobalt, while their most recent uh, projection from 2022, that yellow line at the bottom, shows a much uh, slower growth um, over the next sort of 10 years or so. Um, and that's really driven by um, the market being able to respond and shift to using battery chemistries that have lower fractions of cobalt or adopting cobalt-free uh, 
cathode materials like the lithium iron phosphate um, that was mentioned before. And so we've made, been able to make some shifts uh, around that, but it does sort of impact the uh, emissions associated with um, manufacturing batteries um, from raw materials and um, how that compares to recycling processes. And so there are also other battery materials that can be energy intensive that will really drive and contribute to uh, recycling emissions. Um, so again, we've got those cathode materials that can sort of vary by battery chemistry. Um, on the anode side, we have graphitic carbon typically. Um, and so that can either become a contributor um, if you are deploying something like a thermal or pyrometallurgical process, um, become sort of a source of, of CO2 emissions. Um, similarly, most electrolytes have um, organic solvents, uh, plastic separators within those layers. And so those can also uh, contribute to the emissions from a recycling process. And then uh, you also have metals for current collectors, um, which can be recycled and by me more conventional means, uh, but are a contributor to the overall sort of embodied emissions of a battery. And so then when we think about how these different uh, battery materials come together um, in an ultimate design, um, all of those factors of the material selection um, also impact are impacted by uh, the, the battery design itself. Um, so as Hans Eric mentioned, uh, there's uh, a few kind of typical um, battery formats. And so in our studies, we focus on either couch cells or uh, uh, and then jelly roll cells um, where you've got um, these uh, electrode layers. Um, and ideally, you would be able to increase the thickness of these electrode la layers so that you're storing a lot more energy um, for every piece of material within a battery. Couch cells have historically had a bit more design flexibility to achieve sort of these thicker electrode layers, um, especially as we think about larger format applications like electric vehicles. Um, but more recently, there have been efforts to try and increase the energy density of uh, an active uh, material within um, jelly roll sort of cylindrical cells as well. Um, I think Tesla has called it their biscuit tin sort of design, basically trying to have um, these same benefits um, from increasing the amount of actual usable, storable um, energy materials within uh, battery cells um, to reduce sort of the, the embodied emissions uh, per kilowatt hour of energy storage capacity. And so when we look at um, sort of the embodied emissions uh, just to manufacture these different types of batteries, um, from our study, we again considered um, what this would look like in a couple of different electricity grids. And so um, a lot of the energy and emissions are associated with um, uh, electricity. And so we compared like the US average versus um, two different uh, electricity grids. And we see that as the sort of battery chemistry uh, varies, uh, we have different results in terms of embodied CO2 um, for cylindrical and pouch cells. And so for these high energy density nickel and cobalt containing uh, battery chemistries, there wasn't as, as substantial a difference per kilowatt hour, depending on what type of cell you were building. Uh, but when we ran the study a few years ago, uh, the energy density of lithium iron phosphate or LFP batteries um, was much lower. And so if you wanted to make these smaller cylindrical cells, you ended up having a lot of uh, extra material relative to the amount of energy you were storing. Um, and so you had this higher uh, embodied emissions uh, associated with just man manufacturing these smaller LFP cells. Uh, we didn't see as drastic of an increase. Um, we were, had a little bit more design flexibility in a pouch cell, uh, but there are these high embodied emissions um, associated with just manufacturing any battery from the get-go. And so the idea for recycling is to be able to either um, beat uh, or greatly reduce uh, some of these uh, emissions associated with manufacturing. And so for our study, um, again, we uh, sort of had to um, bin our the vast sort of quantities of, that, of recycling processes out there because there are obviously every sort of company has their own special sort of secret sauce of how they combine um, different techniques to go from a full battery pack to uh, something you would actually want to recover. Um, and so we started, we used pyrometallurgical recycling, um, where basically you're melting battery materials down into um, uh, a, a sort of a transition metal alloy. And so the heat for those processes is uh, derived from fossil fuel sources, whether that's natural gas, sometimes it can still be either uh, a coal or a coke as well. 
Um, typically lithium has been left in the flag, although as the price of lithium has um, come up, there's been more interest in trying to recover that material. Um, and then the recovered material sort of output of that traditional pyrometallurgical process would need to be uh, reprocessed to become what you would actually want to put into a battery grade uh, precursor. Um, the second sort of bin of processes we considered was this hydro hydrometallurgical, um, where we're basically using solvents to separate out battery materials and precipitate um, specific uh, target products. Uh, hy hydrometallurgical processes are typically much lower temperature, um, and the emissions are associated with some electricity and also the uh, solvents that are used uh, throughout those processes. And the recovered material is typically closer to battery grade, although it might not necessarily be quite at the same uh, purity that you would ultimately want to have um, in a uh, battery manufacturing process. And then we also consider direct recycling. And so these are definitely uh, more uh, in earlier stage technologies than sort of pyrometallurgical or hydrometallurgical processing um, per se, but um, the, the advantage of this direct recycling method is that you can maintain some of the structure that you've already built into uh, manufacturing these combinations of metals into a cathode material, uh, but ideally you would have prior knowledge of what material you're trying to uh, recycle, right? So you want to know what battery, what kind of battery materials are input into this process. Um, and again, you need to relithiate uh, the uh, battery materials because um, as the batteries had cycled over their first life, uh, the amount of lithium present um, in the actual cathode material uh, is depleted over time. And so you need to replace that if you actually want to get it back to um, the same quality that you would install in um, a new uh, battery. And so um, to compare those different processes, um, we, we used a comparative analysis of how um, a recycled battery uh, from a manufacturing's perspective would compare from the, to the emissions associated with uh, producing a new battery uh, from scratch. And so again, we did this for different types of battery uh, architectures, right? So we did cylindrical and pouch cells. Um, and again, we repeated this process um, for um, NMC cathodes, NCA cathodes, and this uh, lithium iron phosphate, right? So some of them that were containing uh, nickel and cobalt and some of them that were not. Um, and so we can see um, in each of the cases that we were considering, uh, the pyrometallurgical recycling um, had a net increase in uh, CO2 emissions, right? So because you are consuming um, uh, these fossil fuel resources um, to um, reprocess uh, that battery material, there's always going to be an emissions uh, associated with that process. Um, and if you think about the constituent uh, components of these batteries, there are a lot of components that if you uh, engage them in a thermal process, uh, that they will have, um, that they will also themselves contribute to uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, from a hydrometallurgical perspective, uh, we saw that um, for the nickel and cobalt uh, containing uh, cylindrical cells, that there is potential for emissions reductions. Um, although there was a lot of uncertainty on those predictions, um, and on, the, on those estimates. And so a lot of that was because you were able to recover the increased amount of metal that comes from the cylindrical batteries um, uh, that's available uh, to offset some of these emissions as well. So if you're recovering like steel or other um, current collectors, uh, that can also uh, help to reduce the overall emissions. Um, and we didn't see that same increase um, in pouch cells, which have uh, larger fractions of uh, electrode materials relative to other metals. And so then uh, when we looked at the uh, direct recycling for these uh, cobalt and nickel uh, heavy uh, chemistries, we saw that there were um, net uh, reductions in uh, CO2 emissions, especially for these pouch cells that had um, larger fractions of cathode material relative to other um, cell designs. And so then the important thing to note is that when we were looking at this um, and we were comparing um, for LFP batteries to um, other chemistries, um, the reason that you know LFP batteries are so um, inexpensive is because we've gotten very good at uh, producing the input materials, right? So iron, phosphates, um, those are easily, uh, relatively easily mined. We have a lot of infrastructure available for that. And so um, we weren't necessarily seeing the same offsets because they don't have 
um, really, really energy intensive materials within them uh, to the same extent that nickel or cobalt um, takes to produce. And so until uh, those conditions change, uh, we're not necessarily seeing an emissions reductions uh, given the sort of current uh, state of technologies and the state of where um, we're producing a lot of the, the solvents and other materials used um, to uh, conduct these recycling processes. And so I think moving forward, there's a lot of uh, interesting questions about how um, battery recycling will be impact by, impacted by further changes in battery materials, right? So we've got these um, sandwich layers. And so increasing the specific capacity of just the materials uh, that we use uh, to store energy within these batteries will inherently help uh, the emissions, reduce the emissions of manufacturing and recycling per kilowatt hour, right? So you're still producing uh, perhaps uh, the same uh, kilograms of material, but per kilowatt hour of energy stored in that material, um, there's less um, embodied energy and embodied emissions. Uh, the processes that we're using um, to recycle these batteries have to be able to adapt to the different mass fractions of materials. And we might need to add things like new solvents, especially to a hydrometallurgical process. If the content of uh, battery materials is changing, um, we're having smaller fractions of cobalt, um, perhaps uh, additional materials that we weren't uh, using and weren't as, as prevalent um, in earlier stages of electric vehicles uh, may uh, transform sort of what's necessary from a technology perspective. Um, and then uh, the transitions to low or no cobalt cathodes um, inherently mean that we are probably are producing those materials um, from their raw forms uh, with lower emissions. And so if we want to have net uh, greenhouse gas emissions offsets compared to that alternative material, um, we have to have recycling processes that are both more efficient um, and utilize more uh, low carbon electricity. And so the other big piece is that this isn't happening in a vacuum, right? So battery recycling will inherently be impacted by changes in our overall energy system. Uh, so our electricity systems uh, continue to decarbonize. Um, and so that will reduce um, emissions at recycling facilities through their electricity consumption. Um, and it also might, uh, from an upstream perspective, reduce the emissions uh, associated with producing uh, solvents that are used in many of these processes. Um, but if we're using um, fossil fuels directly in some of these recycling uh, options, we're not going to see those same emissions reductions um, because they're not uh, capturing or reducing uh, CO2 emissions. And so uh, if we think about sort of where it moves forward, if you can incorporate more things like mechanical recycling or mechanical disassembly as opposed to pyrometallurgical processing, uh, that could be a way to further reduce uh, associated emissions um, and then uh, transitioning to uh, more uh, flexible options that don't necessarily utilize fossil fuel resources. And so just to uh, summarize, so today's uh, recycling processes don't necessarily uh, guarantee emissions reductions when you compare uh, manufacturing from new materials. This is especially true if we've gotten very good at producing uh, the raw materials uh, used in some of these battery technologies. Uh, recycling has to continue to evolve and adapt to uh, changes in battery materials, right? So uh, as the market develops, there, are, there will always be sort of new trends in battery chemistries that are most common. And so we have to be able to adapt our recycling capacity uh, to those trends. Um, and so finally, recycling can provide some assistance as Hans Eric mentioned, uh, the demand for lithium ion battery materials will continue to grow um, exponentially over the, uh, the next couple of decades. And we are, we are gonna face a lag for a very, very long time um, in available material, recyclable materials to actually uh, form this circular economy. And so uh, we do still need to consider uh, local environmental burdens associated with mining um, and siting uh, new facilities. But uh, recycling can help on the margins, but realistically, we will we'll probably face that, those challenges for a very long time. So with that, I would just like to acknowledge a lot of this work was done when I was at Carnegie Mellon, um, and it was funded by the National Science Foundation. Okay, thank you very much, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Ian Rowe. I am your co-moderator for this session, and I'll introduce the next speaker in a minute. But first, I think we have another poll question that we were going to introduce, and this one is on recycling rates of different materials. So out of the materials listed there, which of these materials has the lowest recycling rate in the US? Lead acid batteries, lithium ion, um, HDPE clear hollow polymer, or PET bottles? 
Any guesses? So I'll give you five, four, three, two, one. And the answer is lithium ion batteries. Um, yes, and I don't know if we're gonna put, yes. So lithium ion batteries are currently recycled according to the DOE numbers at less than 5%, while lead acid is up around 95%. And um, HP, HDPE uh, clear milk jug type plastics and PET bottles are recycled around 29%. Um, there's a lot of things at play here. Lead batteries are, have a lot of heavy regulations associated with them. And uh, there's a lot of systems already in place to incentivize the recycling of them. And plastics are all have a lot of locations where you can recycle them already. Lithium ion batteries are not acceptable, like you can't put them at curbside most places yet, and finding places to actually drop them off is actually difficult um, in some locations. So now with that poll question out of the way, we will move on to our third and final speaker for the day. Um, Bryant Polzin, uh, he's a process engineer with Argonne National Lab. Uh, he, where he supports R&D of lithium ion batteries for transportation. Uh, he focuses on material evaluation and the recycling and scale up of batteries. Uh, his published work touches on many aspects of lithium ion battery development and performance. Prior to joining Argonne, he worked in industry and he has a master's degree from Illinois Institute of Technology and Material Sciences and Metallurgical Engineering and a BS from Iowa State University in Ceramic Engineering. With that, Brian, I'm gonna kick it over to you. Hello, everyone. There we go. All good. Should be all good? Yep. All right, let me just hide that. All right, uh, yes, uh, thank you for having me today. And uh, today I'm going to kind of touch on the future of lithium ion battery recycling. Um, so as Ian said, I'm from Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, I am also the uh, deputy director of the Resale Center uh, at Argonne National Laboratory. So the Resale Center is uh, the DOE Vehicles Technologies Office first battery recycling R&D center. It is a collaboration of four national laboratories uh, and four universities. So the, the national laboratories are Argonne National Lab, uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Idaho National Laboratory, and Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, and we have uh, four universities, which is uh, WPI, uh, University of San Diego, California, uh, Tennessee State University and Michigan Tech uh, involved in this. And the way the Resale Center is broken down is we've got five focus areas. Uh, the first one is the direct recycling of materials, which has 26 projects in it. And this is, uh, as some of the speakers before me mentioned, this is primarily focused on direct recycling of materials. So how do we get materials out of these batteries in the same form that they went in, of course, rejuvenated, cleaned up to be put back into a, a battery. We also have, uh, and we've got you know, 26 projects in there. The second focus area is what we call advanced resource recovery. So in these 13 projects, these are more focused on what can we do to aid in the hydrometallurgical and pyrometallurgical recycling processes to improve yield, performance, purity levels, uh, of, of processes associated with those recycling technologies. We also have eight projects in design, design for sustainability. This is mostly looking at second life effects on recyclability, uh, uh, um, applications for second life, grading of cells, uh, and also removing of cells from uh, EV packs and uh, how do we do that successfully, cheaply, and safely. Uh, the other main focus area that we have is modeling and analysis. Uh, so this one in the modeling uh, world, we've got, a, you know, in total, we have 11 projects there in the modeling world. We're looking at uh, process modeling. So both TEA, techno-economic modeling, as well as life cycle analysis modeling. Uh, we have several supply chain type models, 
uh, looking at the effects of recycling on materials flow, not in the United States, but all over the world. And how is how are these materials going to help meet the demands going forward uh, that EVs and other applications are going to require of lithium ion batteries? In the last one, uh, last focus area that we have is cross cutting efforts. Uh, and these are facilities that we utilize at the different national laboratories, uh, such as the cell analysis, uh, modeling and prototyping facility, the post-test facility, um, as well as uh, the uh, materials engineering research facility. Uh, so these are facilities to help do work uh, on there. Um, okay. So, you know, the great question is, well, what does the future look like uh, for recycling? And what I like to say is there's no single recycling technology that's going to win out in the future. Um, every recycling technology is going to have its own place uh, in, the, in the recycling environment. Um, there's advantages and, van and disadvantages for direct recycling. There's advantages and disadvantages for hydro. And same thing with pyro. Um, and so some of those... Um, advantages and disadvantages are also going to change with what the type of material that's being processed. You know, if you have consumer electronics versus manufacturing scrap versus end-of-life batteries, they're all in different states of, of disrepair. And so some may need less work to get it back into a usable state. Some may need more. And so that may dictate the potential for which recycling uh, process to use to get the, the most benefit out of recycling those materials. And lastly, you know, companies are really going to are, are going to balance what what's important to them or, you know, safety. Is it cost? Is it environmental impact, energy usage, water usage? Um, you know, if I'm in a desert, you know, Nevada or Utah, you know, do I want to create a process that has a huge you know, amount of water usage where that could be a huge cost uh, in that location to have water there? Uh, where energy is cheap. So maybe, you know, you would you would use a process or processes that are more energy intensive based upon the location um, of where you're trying to site your, your facility. Safety, um, you know, not just safety for, um, you know, you could look at it as in terms of safety for your workers, uh, as well as safety for the environment. Um, if I have an electric vehicle battery that that has been in a crash or uh, a damaged, you know, defective or recalled battery, do I want people trying to break that down into the module or cell level um, where, you know, in, in some cases it might just be able to be best to just handle that is and accept the loss in recyclable content for the safety of, of handling that. So all of these, these things are going to be decisions that that company and industry is going to have to decide and balance um, what makes the most sense for them. So one of the technologies that's really emerging in the recycling field uh, is what was mentioned before is, is direct recycling. Um, direct recycling is, is one of those high risk, high reward technologies. Uh, it's, it's been in development for a handful of years. Uh, there's been a lot of work into it, uh, and you know we've de-risk uh, some of the processes used to do it, uh, but there's still more work that needs to be done on top of being able to scale uh, this system up to a pilot or industrial scale. Um, so yeah, it's behind the curve in terms of hydro and pyro because those have been used for years, and, and not only in, in the battery industry, but in other industries, uh, recycling industries as well. So really direct is, is kind of starting from, from scratch. And so, you know, the, the, the people that are working on direct recycling are really working to invent new processes, trying to do things differently in a specific way. Um, and, and so, you know, we're starting at the bench scale research and graduating these processes um, up uh, to larger and larger scales as we see success coming out of, out of those results. Um, on top of that, you know, there's multiple ways to do any single step in, in a recycling process. So we're trying to also look at multiple steps within a, in, in, within a recycling process to give, again, industry options to say, well, what's most important to you? you know, here's multiple ways to do the same process. You can pick and choose what you would like to do. And also in some of these uh, processes, 
you know, they can also benefit the other recycling processes. So especially on the front end of this, say the battery shredding step, the electrolyte recovery, and the, the, the cathode, anode, and metal separation, if there's improvement in those processes, they can also benefit both the hydro and the pyro process by providing those recycling technologies with a better or a higher impurity black mass going into them. So they would benefit overall. And so typically here's a direct recycling process flow. So you start with end of life batteries and we would shred those, you would recover the electrolyte and then you would do some cathode, anode and metal separation step. And let's just focus on the cathode because that's the most valuable material right now coming out of a uh, lithium ion battery. You would end up with a cathode carbon black and PVDF mix. And then you have some carbon black and PVDF removal process. So that all you're left with is the cathode material. The cathode then can either go get relithiated or upcycled. And then that material you would have is a rejuvenated cathode and be put back into the battery manufacturing process. So in, in, in relithiation, that's the process of adding the lost lithium back into the cathode material. But then we also have what's called upcycling. So, you know, some of the, the, the EV batteries, you know, they're lasting 10, 15, 20 years. That is a very old technology. So we're looking at how do we convert some of those old technologies in NMC, say, 111, and converting them to say NMC 811, which is more of a more of an industrial relevant cathode chemistry. And so we're looking at processes how to, to not just recycle the material, but make it into more of a state of the art material. So one of the examples, uh, you know, we're looking at, at relithiation technologies, at relithiation steps. So the traditional route is the thermal or solid state route where you're taking your lithium source like lithium hydroxide, and then you're doing some type of annealing step or calcination step to, to get that lithium back into the crystal structure and make that cathode particle like new. Um, but we're looking at other methods, more novel methods that could either reduce cost, reduce emissions, you know, reduce the the energy cost, the water cost, uh, but again, to provide multiple solutions uh, to companies and de-risk them so that companies can, can make their own, you know, do their choose their own adventure uh, on the recycling process. So we're looking at hydrothermal processes for, um, for relithiation. We have a brand new uh, novel one called, uh, which uses a redox mediator to uh, to get the lithium into the, the, the spent cathode material. Uh, we have an ionothermal or molten salt system that we're looking at, as well as an electrochemical system uh, where we would actually take spent cathode material, recode it onto an electrode, and in a roll-to-roll -roll process, use electrochemistry to relithiate that um, cathode in an electrode form. So all of these are really novel novel uh, processes. And, and we're looking at, you know, again, to, to, to try and scope out and de-risk technologies for industry to pick up and use in, in, their, uh, in their processes. So, you know, what a couple, some of the questions that I was asked to answer is, you know, kind of, you know, what does changing chemistries have, you know, what's the impact of changing chemistries on, on recycling going to have? Um, and so really the future of batteries is wide open. There's so many different routes that, that batteries for EVs or grid storage or consumer electronics can go. And they, they, there's a lot of unknowns out there. Um, so the first case, like silicon anodes, they're starting to make it into EV batteries these days. Um, the, the, the cathode and, and the electrolytes and everything should be relatively the same, but what, you know, what additional separation steps are needed? If you're adding another material uh, into these processes, you're gonna have to create another material to remove it uh, from, the, the, from the materials that you want. Um, so potentially adding silicon could add separation steps, which would increase the cost, no matter what process you're using potentially um, to have to remove that. Or if you're trying to look at it from a direct value or even hydrothermal, um, what value would that recovered silicon have? Is, is, are you, can you find an application or a product that you can still make money on 
by having to recover that silicon. Solid state batteries, um, the recycling is going to become a, a much, much more difficult. Um, you're, there's a lot of different materials that are being discussed uh, about what the actual solid state electrolytes is going to be. And the more materials you introduce into the system, the harder, again, the harder it's going to be to pull them out uh, to the purity levels that you need. Um, it's, a, it's a slightly different battery, um, how it's assembled. And so you may need more mechanical processing uh, or material separ separation steps to pull those, those materials out. Um, and again, uh, because you have different and more materials, the impurity con uh, content downstream um, is going to inherently come up. And so you're going to have to figure out how to remove those materials. And, you know, again, if you're going to if you're going to separate or move, pull them out, what value do these additional new materials have? Um, it, it's a great question that are, it's going to have to be answered in terms of long term. Um, lithium metal batteries, you know, the big one it would be safety issues, you know, shredding and black mass transportation. Um, you can have exposed lithium metal to, to oxygen or moisture, and, and that's a highly reactive system. Um, so the safety and the handling of, of recycling of lithium metal batteries uh, is going to be a huge factor that people are going to have to look at uh, and, and design systems around to, to make sure that everyone is safe. Another technology that, that's on the horizon um, is lithium sulfur batteries. Um, this one is a, a very similar argument to uh, lithium, you know, the current lithium iron phosphate batteries. You know, it's the, the value of the materials versus the cost of recycling. Um, is, is, it, is it not going to be financially advantageous to recycle lithium ion or lithium sulfur batteries? Um, is lithium the only recoverable material in a val of, of value in that system? Um, so these are questions and things that, that as these chemistries are changing, we're going to have to answer. And lastly, you know, sodium ion batteries, um, you know, it, I think the processes could be similar to current lithium ion batteries today. Um, but again, you know, what materials are in those our systems and are they worthy of, of recovery? Um, so that's where, you know, the, the techno-economic modeling and the LCA of, of the recycling processes and the materials in there are going to be critical now and in the future to understand, you know, what recycling processes make the most sense. So another one is, is second life applications. And I know Hans touched upon this, but you know, what do you do with batteries uh, after their second life use? Um, and one of the arguments I, you know, I hear is that uh, you have to choose between, is your battery gonna go to second life use or recycling? And I really think that's a misnomer that, that people ask that question. It's not, it's not an either or choice um, because even when batteries, you know, if they do go into a second life, it's not like they automatically are gonna get landfilled after second, second life use, they're gonna get recycled. So really the only thing that second life use does is push out when the batteries are available for recycling. So, you know, it could be an additional five to 10 years for that battery to make it back into the recycling stream and have that material uh, be recycled and put back into the supply chain. Um, and so, you know, that, that's just the, the, the question of, of recycle versus second life. But really second life applications are just in their infancy. There are so many questions around, you know, uh, of how do you, you know, how do you make second life applications a, a real thing? You know, how do you source your batteries? Are they from a single manufacturer? Are they from a different manufacturer? How do you deal with different states of health and, and different states of charges of batteries? How do you create a business model around something that you may or may not control uh, because of the changing chemistries or formats in electric vehicle batteries? And the big one is really, you know, um, how do you warranty uh, your product or get insurance for your product or certification? Um, these are all great questions that people are going to want to see if they're going to put a second life battery uh, into, you know, a home or a business for, for energy storage. So the great news is there's still plenty of uh, R&D &D that needs to be done in this area to help answer some of these questions 
and help help move this this uh, uh, you know move this industry along into something um, you know uh, more permanent and a viable option for end of life batteries usage. Lastly, design for sustainability um, is is a is a great great topic. It has got the biggest tent potential to um, impact how things are recycled, um, at least in terms of EV batteries and even consumer electronics. But it's the hardest to gain traction, you know. And there's really two factors that make this very difficult. Um, if you're designing a new battery component, it could take years before that gets into production. And so that means, you know, that it that benefit of something like that will take a long time before you get to see it back. So um, th th there's a there's a design cycle that we have to think about. There's some companies that are doing it now, um, some OEMs looking at factors like this. But again, it's still for batteries that that need to get designed, that need to get put into a model year, and then those batteries need to make it through their use life and come back into the recycling stream. The other big factor is how do you convince an OEM or pack manufacturer to spend extra money up front um, for a benefit that they will not see, such as re reduced recycling cost? So if you say, you know, don't weld these joints together, use this nut and bolt, um, and that would make it easier, the OEM or the pack manufacturer is going to have to buy that bolt, but they may not see, you know, there's no advantage for them to add money to their pack cost for someone else to see the benefit. Now, I think there is, you know, there is a potential break in this area in that I think you're starting to see a lot more OEM or pack manufacturers or battery manufacturers looking at vertical integration through either joint ventures or production contracts, and that's extending into the recycling world. And so now you could see a justification for, hey, I can spend a couple more dollars up front because I might be able to save $5 on the back end. And guess what? That means the material that I'm procuring is going to be $5 cheaper on the back end. So I come out $3 ahead in something like this. Um, and so we're, we're starting to see this, but I think the, you know these concepts are, are still a ways off. But again, there needs to be a really strong R&D focus um, along with strong testing and analysis because these, you know, these, these substitutions that you know, we would want for, to enable design for recycling or easier recyclability of packs and modules, an OEM needs to, to understand the testing and analysis on how these systems work, make sure that they don't break down over times um and hey Brian, so right this, yeah. this is mark we we've got a lot of great questions can you kind of start wrapping yeah. it up please thank okay. you all right so why does this all matter so doe and, and the white house's goal is you know we're looking at a 50 percent ev adoption rate for new cars sales by 2030 so that is looking at 7.6 million dollars, 7.6 new EVs on the road to be sold in 2030. And so there's a lot of different ways that we can we can hit those numbers by enabling lower cost batteries. And so again, looking at next generation battery R&D, looking at different ways of recycling uh, materials, and then also through the the Infrastructure Act um, and uh, funding development of the US supply chain. And so uh, one of the, the groups that, uh, that is, has been put together is this group called the Federal Consortium for Advanced Batteries. And there's a specific task group that's looked at recycling and reuse. So the Department of Energy by itself is not gonna be able to solve all of the recycling problems. And so we're gonna really have to get organizations across all organizations, so EPA, DOE, <coughs> DOT, DOD, State Commerce, USGS, RPE, to put in and talk about, well, how can we affect the recycling industry? How do we either make it easier? How do we make regulations known um, so that we can enable this recycling technology? So this is a group that meets regularly, and here are their near and long-term goals uh, for the FCAB recycling group. And then lastly, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I think this is, yep. 
So um, if everyone knows the infrastructure, the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law or bill um, has really uh, has been uh, passed and has provided a huge number of opportunities uh, in propping up or, or helping the domestic battery supply chain. And so here's a number of different sections within the infrastructure law, the bill law of funding opportunities in different areas uh, all across the supply chain. And so uh, these are, some are currently um, in process right now. Some will be coming out uh, shortly, but these would be sections that I believe that this group uh, on recycling would be very interested in following up on. And so, yep, I just would like to say thank you to everyone who helped put this together and participated. Great, thank you. So we're, we have the last poll question posted now. The, that question is, how likely are you to favor building a recycling facility in your community? Extremely likely, somewhat likely, or not very likely. So if you go ahead and uh, answer that poll question, please. This one, there is really no right answer. This is just a poll to see what the community says. We'll close this one in five, four, three, two, one. And Ayana will put this in the, in the, oh, there we go. So uh, majority of people said somewhat likely at 60%, 30% extremely likely, and only 10% at not very likely. So I'd like to kick off the Q&A uh, portion here by starting with a couple of very, uh, hopefully quick, uh, clarifying questions. And they're both directed at Rebecca. Uh, we had people ask, uh, what you meant by specific energy when you use that term. And then the second question directed at you was to go back and, and give a simple explanation of how emissions are negative for the recycling processes, please. Sure. So specific energy is just per kilogram, how much energy can be stored in some kind of cathode material. And so as battery materials have gotten better, that number has typically gone up, right? So you can, you can store more energy uh, per sort of kilogram of stuff uh, that you're installing. And then um, for the negative emissions, so this was a comparative analysis. And so we were looking at if you were baking a battery from uh, recycled materials or if you're making a battery from sort of raw materials manufacturing, um, what would the net avoided emissions be? And so anything above that sort of zero line was a positive, right? Net negative, uh, net reductions and avoided emissions, right? So you were reducing the emissions if it was a positive number. And then anything below zero meant that you were increasing emissions. So you weren't avoiding emissions, you were creating more. Um, so hopefully that sort of clarifies uh, those questions. I, I think so, certainly did for me. Ian, you got a question you want to ask? Um, I do indeed. Thank you. Um, let me see if I can get my camera back up. There it is. Um, where did my question go? Ah, so we talked uh, as OEMs today continue to develop and work to improve EVs. Uh, they'll, of course, have their own incentives to improve their battery capacity, to improve their vehicles, and you know, put their own secret sauce into the process. Um, and they also might be incentivized to not tell industry at large what they're working on and what the specifics about their battery are. So how does this um, kind of, this doesn't really align with recyclability if you have everybody doing their own thing, but it doesn't really align with recyclability. Can any of the panelists speak to this potential incompatibility between OEMs trying to do their own thing while also trying to stand up a recycling infrastructure? Well, I, I, I can certainly talk a little bit about that. Um, I agree that, um, I mean that connection is not very, I mean it, it, it's not great. Um, even if you talk to, to car dismantlers or car breakers, I mean they uh, even in Europe where we have quite tight legislation around this, uh, the the relationship between the OEMs and the car dismantlers is is, um, is not um, it's not great. And um, many believe that they, they don't even can get access to to disassembly instructions and uh, how to do that so and uh, and even less uh, i believe that the design for recycling is something that is taking is taken into into consideration and i can understand that i mean it's it's really batteries that will last for a very long time um it's uh, still a growing market this is still a market where we are where technology is discovered um so i mean it's really about performance it's really about 
to, to minimizing cost um, in a transition, which for the OEMs are very costly, or is very costly. So, but I think there are another, a few other incentives there. I mean, design for repairability, for instance, uh, design for remanufacturing. Um, we have had a few huge recalls um, among uh, some of the OEMs that has been very, very costly, which means that uh, they, they, I think they're all incentivized to, to, to know that if the same thing will happen again, um, it makes sense for them to, um, to, to be able to, to remove uh, either cell groups or, uh, or, or modules um, in, 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 in a way that is uh, also would benefit um, later on uh, for the recycling process. And I think, for instance, like if you take BYD's play batteries, um, um, uh, I hear very few complaints, in fact, uh, about the, the disassembly of, of that battery. So um, in some cases, I think it actually goes in the right direction. Right. So, so Hans Eric, while you're on the hot seat, I'll keep you there. Lots of questions about our poll question about five percent because you already dissed that in your talk. But I, I certainly triangulated many of the references going back even to Bureau of Mines and other data on cobalt recycling rates and where it was being lost. And it it does look like most people you indicated Russia or excuse me uh, Australia at three percent, U.S. saying less than five percent recycling. Why is there the big discrepancy, and what do you think the right number is? I think it's highly unfortunate that this is used so widely and it's used in a, I think in a really amateurish way. Um, there are two 5% numbers that generate, that they are both a little bit more than 10 years old. One generates and come from Europe, another come from a paper in the US. And in none of the cases, see this actually, they could show where these 5% came from. In one of the American papers come from 95% landfill. And if, if you want to measure how much any kind of product is landfilled, there is only one place you have to look. And that's in the, in the landfill. Um, and, and as far as I know, there are only two papers, one American, one day, uh, when in, from Denmark, that actually look at what is actually found in, in the landfills. And, um, and they find the fine batteries, the fine lithium ion batteries. They find actually more lead acid batteries. They find more alkaline batteries. Um, another thing when it comes to the comparison of lead acid, lead, lead acid recycling ratio that often is referred to like 99%. Um, that is a, a ratio that is based on uh, what waste generated um, or, or the, the, how much the ba batteries that are recycled compared to what the waste which is generated. Uh, then you have to measure lithium ion batteries in the same way. And nobody really knows how much waste that is generated from lithium ion batteries. Well, well and, uh, let me push back just a little bit. In the lead acid case, it's clear that we've regulated something there. And in the case of lead acid, the companies that deliver the batteries take the recycled batteries. I don't see a metaphor at all like that for for lithium ion today. It just it just doesn't exist. The number of things that I can't get rid of with lithium ion batteries is large. Well, well. <laughs> um, Lead acid batteries, first of all, I mean, they've been in the market for 150 years and been in our vehicles for 100 years. Um, you have to replace them every three or four years. Correct. Uh, so so you, you have a, a, a very different kind of flow of batteries, while lithium ion batteries usually sit in their whole life in the vehicles. And the, these vehicles are also, uh, also traded and, um, and, and removed. And the same thing for lead acid batteries. I mean, it, it, if you look at how much lithium ion batteries that are placed on the market, then you compare, okay, so, and how much are we recycle? If you looked at my chart, how few lithium ion batteries that 10 years ago were placed on the American market, and, uh, and I said most of them batteries are, have not been available right. for recycling in the sure. US because they are in the rest of the world, in phones, in laptops, wherever, where they have been used. Mm -hmm. um, but also, if if you would do the same for lead acid batteries, I mean, more than a million vehicles, ICE vehicles from the US are exported to other countries every year. They contain lead acid batteries. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how could it be even 99% when, when there actually a huge amount of lead acid batteries in the US are leaving the country and are not recycled in the US? 
But that can be because we are looking at waste generated from lead acid, but we are not looking at waste generated or available co for collection. That is another term we can also right. use. So when it comes to so what is the actual, the correct number? Um, very hard to, to say, in fact, because you have to see what is the actual waste, what, what should be recycled. And I think we are, we are not at 100%, but we are not very far from it. Obviously, there are a lot of small batteries that goes into appliances, which people are actually throwing in the waste. I don't think a lot of people throw mobile phones in the waste, but they, they might throw um, toys or power banks or things like that. And we hear these stories about how they go in, into material recovery facilities and, and for sure they're creating fires. So, th so that is a real problem, absolutely. But that is rarely anyone throws an EV battery in the, in, in the trash. Yeah. Uh, I, I, well, I absolutely agree. The EVs are, are our market and hopefully the lead acid and some of the success that we have there proving that we can keep the recycling rate as high as it is, is an example with where, where the transportation batteries take off. It will be a similar thing, right? I'm optimistic more than pessimistic about the lead acid. It, it is more difficult with products with long lifetimes. I mean, when we compare with, with, PET, uh, when we, with PET bottles and, and things like that, I mean, that is something that we consume uh, within a couple of weeks after they were produced. So, so it's much easier to, to do, to, to create more circular flows of that kind of products. If you have lifetimes of, of 10 or 20 years, it's both difficult to actually create these processes for it because the incentive comes so much later, really, into, in, into setting these facilities up. I think to, today, actually, we... we I mean, from a consumer producer perspective, we can be happy because we, we are building more recycling capacity today than what we will need for many, many years. So Ian, you got a favorite question now? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've seen a couple uh, similar to this come through, um, but it mostly, I guess this is directed first at Rebecca, related to the non-carbon dioxide inter, uh, environmental impacts. So you, you talked about... Uh, the, the LCA of most of these recycling processes. Can you touch on any of the other environmental impacts of them and which, which, which are the ones that can be toned down the best with R&D perhaps? Yeah, so, and it really depends. We didn't necessarily do a full like digging into each, you know, nitty gritty LCA potential impact. Um, I think there's a lot associated with uh, potential air pollution, criteria pollution em emissions. If you were doing a pyrometallurgical process, I think citing those kinds of facilities in the United States has been pretty challenging, um, or at least new facilities of that kind of type. Um, and then again, sort of as Bryant mentioned, uh, some of the water challenges associated with uh, the chemical processing um, can be a larger uh, percentage, uh, especially in some of the more water stress regions of the United States. And so um, citing those appropriately might also be a challenge. So I got one for Bryant here. Uh, what is the current TRL level of direct recycling technologies that you guys are investigating at Reso? Um, I, you know, I would say a lot of our processes are TRL, maybe two to four or so, um, but there are actually two companies uh, or three companies in the United States that are actually standing up pilot lines uh, for direct recycling purposes. Um, so there, there is an industry being built around direct recycling. There's, there's companies out there with skin in the game and, and they believe in the technology. Um, and so, uh, yeah, they're, they're, this is not just a, a direct recycling is not just a, a lab dream. It, it's being rolled out into industry. So to, to stay on this question, so a lot of what you described was um, direct recycling and some innovations there. Um, does resell investigate ways to improve the solvent extraction process of? Uh, yes, that, that was in the um, advanced resource recovery uh, focus area. So we've got a number of uh, technologies that we're we're developing right now to, to again like different methods of of uh, separations of of materials either via solvents or other methods uh, again to get to a high uh, high quality low impurity uh, content product that could be either converted to a salt or if it is a salt itself can be in, reintroduced into the cathode manufacturing uh, process. Okay, I. Ask whether we can do one more question since I haven't gotten an answer. I'll try to squeeze another question in. Uh, a couple of people have asked about the European battery passport. Can somebody explain what that is and whether they think it's a good idea or not? 
Well, I can talk about it. Um, so, so the the battery passport is um, um, it's um it should be an individual. Well, basically a passport. I mean, it could be a digital. Um, I mean, containing information about the actual battery. Uh, it is not clear exactly what it will contain. Um, but the idea is obviously that you should have everything from dismantling instructions to to um, you should have information about the actual materials and that is included, what kind of chemistry the cathode or the anode has. Uh, so it has everything to, to do with making the situation better for anyone from like remanufacturers, refurbishers to recyclers. Uh, so this information will follow the batteries. There is also, of course, um, um, a wish to be able to track the batteries. Um, I think a little bit of the inspiration comes from a battery passport that is available in China, where you where, where they are tracking the batteries uh, throughout the different stages of their life cycle. It is not uh, it's not an easy task. Uh, it's one thing to have a battery passport, but you also need passport controls, so you need border controls. <laughs> and, and that is, I mean, not so easy really to to. Um, uh, to introduce, and I think that, that is what, where China has had problems. I mean, they, because the batteries have not really taken the route that uh, everybody wished for. I mean, China, the Chinese market is quite similar, in fact, to, to not least the American market, that the, the highest value usually wins, or the highest bidder uh, win, win the batteries. Um, but um, I mean, it's a, it's a very exciting idea. I don't think it will change a lot, but I think it's great to, to that you have more information that you can uh, cater to the, I mean, those companies that actually we deal with the batteries further on. So, I mean, in that way, it's, it's great. But I, I don't think it will be uh, revolutionary in the sense that it will keep the batteries in the, in, in the market uh, better than if we, we wouldn't have okay. it. Well, we're rapidly coming up on our time. So I certainly, this has been a lot of fun helping put this uh, session together. And I want to thank all of our three speakers the, it, for the great talks. It's been wonderful. I certainly learned a lot and hope everybody in the audience did. And I can now give Ian the last word. So, Hey, thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks to everybody on the line. Uh, all the speakers, thanks a lot. Appreciate your willingness to do this. I certainly learned a lot. Um, and Ayanna, I don't know if you had anything final to close this out with. Yeah, so for everyone who is watching, you're going to be redirected to a brief survey after the webinar. And then uh, if you'd like to subscribe for more updates or find out any more at the Chemical Sciences Roundtable, you can see our website. And thank you so much for everyone attending. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Take care.